The New York Jets are always seemingly in the news, and it's time to catch up with a good old pal to figure out whether that's good news or bad news. Uh, well, the season's right around the corner. Let's roll. Zoinks. It is unequivocally the Super Bowl for New York Jet fans. Field Gates, baby. Field Gas Yates. Let's bring him on the show. Come on, people. Connor Rogers is joining the show. What's up, Connor? But Trevor Gastard Sycamore, baby. For me, personal, my favorite New York Jet of all time. Wow, it's great to be on. What an intro that was right there. Paul, you, nobody does an intro like you. Paul, you, you give the best intro of literally any podcast that I'm, I've, I've ever seen. I'm going to lose my gas darn bananas. Oh, baby, I'm fired up. I'm Paul Eston Jr., a.k.a. Boy Green. Welcome to Boy Green Daily, a daily New York Jets video show available also wherever you get your podcast. And let's bring on a special guest, a good friend. It's been a hot second. Time to catch up and talk all things football. It's former NFL General Manager Executive of the Year extraordinaire. It's our good buddy, Randy Mueller, here on the program. What's up, Randy? Hey, Paul. Outstanding. Good to be back with you. No no podcast that I've done makes me smile like coming on with you. I'll give you that. That's awesome. And I will tell you that on my resume, that is the most prominent thing featured is getting <laughs> Randy to crack. And uh, as often as we could do that, we'll keep doing this program. So, uh, Randy, uh, one of the things and it's included in our YouTube description down below is a, a column you had for The Athletic talking about the New York Jets. And one of the things that stood out to me is at the beginning of your article, you said that the New York Jets fit this all-in narrative that Jerry Jones said at the Senior Bowl. You said that perhaps the Jets fit that more than any team you can remember over the last 40 years. Why do the Jets stand out in that way? Because there have been teams before that have kind of claimed this all-in narrative before, but perhaps the Jets seem to fit the bill more than anyone before. Why is that? Well, I think it's obvious, right? I mean, they are all in on a 41-year-old Achilles that has to be right, okay? Mm -hmm. And and I give the Jets credit. I'll tell you what, there's a lot of teams that ratchet up expectations. The Jets have, have brought expectations to a fan base that I, I don't know if I've seen. So I'm giving them some credit. They are all in, without a doubt. They've made one-year deals. They've signed older veterans. They've done everything they can to put forth the best team this year. And Jets fans should be happy about that. I, I think probably comes with a little bit of, baggage in years two, three, four of this. But hey, I give them credit. They're all in. And uh, if Aaron Rodgers can be healthy, like I'm sure you've talked about at nauseum, they've got a chance to be a decent team. So that's why I just haven't seen a team in my time in the NFL go into this extent with the amount of one-year deals, the amount of older veterans they've added, just with the idea of we're going to do everything we can for this one year. Is that good news or bad news? Because going all in, it, it's fun. It's sexy. I'm a guy who enjoys, uh, you know, Texas Hold'em. And every once in a while, we, we kind of go around the table and everyone seems to be bluffing or this. And I, I, I just get all aggressive and go all in. And I just throw physically all my chips in the middle of the table. That kind of gets everyone in the room going, whoa, okay, this guy must have something going on here. There's an aggression. There's a passion. There's a lot of excitement with that. But it's risky because if, uh, if I lose that hand, well, I'm done. I, I'm done for the night. I'm guess I'm grabbing a brewski because uh, my, my chips are done and over with. Uh, do you think this is the right move by the Jets and, uh, you know, uh, making this decision as opposed to, as you've laid out in the article, some multi-year plans for uh, some other teams in the league? Well, I think they, they are at the point now where this will be, what, Joe's sixth year. Um, it, the coach is on the hot seat as well. So I understand. They're thinking, I understand what got him here. I've ran NFL teams before to the point where I want to win every year and do everything I can to win every year. But I always had an eye on the future. I always had one eye out there thinking about longer term deals. Um, I think the longer contract structures of certain younger core players are always on my mind. And that takes time. They take a long period to cultivate that relationship with the agent and the player. And sometimes these enormous amounts of money nowadays that these young kids and good players, core players are getting, it takes a long time to sort it all out and to come to an agreement on valuing these players. And 
Maybe the Jets can do that. It sure doesn't look like on paper that they're worried about anything but 2024. But like I said, I credit them with with playing and showing their hand and and almost to a braggadocious point saying, hey, we're all in. This is it. Time will tell if it's right or wrong to answer your question. I don't know. I just think part of a GM's job is to have one eye on the future. And uh, as aggressive as Joe has been, um, I, I tend to think even if they do win this year and if they don't win at all, they've given up a little bit in future years to acquire a couple players. Uh, and I, again, I don't have a problem with that, but I do think you've got to have the future in, in line with a little bit of a longer term plan uh, for, for the most, for most sake. So let's set the line again. It, it is all in for the New York Jets and they're aggressively trying to win this year. What do you think in your mind, the Jets have to do a uh, tangible results wise for everyone to return in 2025? What, what is that watermark in your opinion? Well, I think they've got to obviously get in the playoffs and, and Buffalo is the elephant in the room, right? But uh, Buffalo's kind of remade themselves. Miami is, is in the conversation as well. Um, I think they've got to find a way to show progress in gaining on Buffalo and put themselves in front of Miami. What that means record wise, I don't know, Paul, you tell me. They've got to be, they've got to show at the end of the season that they're further down the road than Miami is and that they are closing fast on Buffalo. So you tell me what kind of record has to happen and do they have to win a game or two in the playoffs to show that? I guess it depends on those other two teams and where they're at as well. What's your temperature on the division? So Buffalo had a lot of reshuffling. This eventually happens to team where the quarterback's cap bit jumps to a larger number and there has to be sacrifices for that uh, to happen. So now the Bills are going to be relying on some younger players to fill some of those key leadership and veteran roles that are on the team. And Miami lost a ton on defense, but they obviously have a lot of talent. What's your temperature check here uh, ahead of training camp uh, on the right. AFC East? I actually like what Buffalo has done. I thought when the season ended for the Buffalo Bills last year to myself, I, d I just don't think this team's good enough. I think they may have to make some changes. And obviously, Brandon Bean thought the same thing. They yeah. rebuilt the secondary totally. Um, they obviously traded a, a former Pro Bowl receiver and rebuilt that room with some quantity as much as quality. Uh, I think they figured we're going to have three or four guys rather than pay one guy $30 million. So I give them credit for that. Let's face it, their defense has to play better. And that is Sean McDermott's bet, you know, bread and butter. He's got to get the defense to play better. And whether the, they got old in the secondary and couldn't get off the field on third down or his blitzing style didn't match up, one of those things has to change, if not both. So I like where the Bills are. I don't think the change is going to kill them. And I think they're going to still be the favorites and should be. With regard to Miami, you mentioned some of the changes they've I think the coaching side is really what people forget about is they've got a new defensive coordinator now. So it's a new scheme. And I know that takes time to understand and learn. And so they are, I think, there for the taking if they're the New York Jets, because as much change as as these other teams have made and, and the Jets have added a couple players, their schemes haven't changed. They've got the same uh, learning curve with really the same nucleus of players and, and if Aaron Rodgers is halfway right, I think that offense should improve. The defense is is really the same as it's been the last three or four years. So I, I like the fact that they have minimized change. So that's why I think Buffalo stands ahead of these other teams, in my opinion. But Miami and the Jets are going to fight it out for second place. And and I think New England's not a very good team, not talented. And that's taken them a few years to to get to that point. But I just don't see them going anywhere right now. I don't mind hearing that at all, Randy. You could repeat that as far as I'm concerned on the New England Patriots. Spectacular. Hey, it goes full circle. The This offseason, the Dynasty documentary dropped on Apple TV Plus and hearing, oh, boy, oh, God, we had to wipe all our tears with these Benjamins and Super Bowl trophies. I'm like, yeah, okay, let's move on. Now we're here. I'm like, okay, about damn time. The Patriots are going to learn what the rest of the NFL has been dealing with for the last couple yeah. of decades. So hopefully a slice of humble pie is warm, sitting out there <laughs> fresh out of the oven. I'm very much Looking forward to that as we're speaking again with former NFL general manager uh, Randy Mueller here on the program. And, and let's get to one of the elephants that are in the room here for the New York Jets is this Hassan Reddick situation 
which also was part of the exits of the other two defensive linemen on their roster. Yeah. Uh, Joe Douglas came out and flat out said it. Hey, as soon as we acquired Reddick, we couldn't keep John Franklin Myers financially. So they had to trade him uh, during the third day of the NFL draft to the Denver Broncos. And then premeditating that in free agency, they let Bryce Huff go, the youngster, in exchange for what they were ultimately going to do. They chased some veteran pass rushers like Jadavion Clowney. He was in the mix. Shaq Barrett was in the mix. Ultimately, they choose uh, to trade for Reddick. What's just your overall read before we get into all the specific layers of this Hassan Reddick situation for someone who they acquired? He was there for the kiss and baby sign and autographs portion of the offseason, and then he was MIA for OTAs and mentor minicamp. Well, it's probably the one move I had the most problem with, Paul, to be honest with you. They let a young ascending player go at the same position, and they maybe he got a little bit more money than they were willing to pay, but then they also give up a future draft pick for an older guy and really a problem child with Carolina. Everybody knew he wanted a new contract. So I struggle with making that swap, and that may have led me as much as anything to, to just really realize how much they're all in for right now. So I don't know how that contract works out. I don't think Robert Sala did him any favors by saying he hadn't talked to him uh, and the communication was was not there. That kind of felt like, you know, something got dumped on somebody's lap and it really wasn't the way I would hope an NFL franchise would communicate both internally and externally with their players. So I struggle with that. Um, I, I like Bryce Huff. I think you knew that. We talked about him last year on your show, as a matter of fact. I think he's a really good player who ascends to a point where – He's not, um, he's not going to, de- he, he, he's, I think he's going to be worth the money paid to them is my point. And I, I am happy about that. And I think somebody's getting a good player in Philadelphia and they may have hoodwinked the Jets on this deal. It seems that way, uh, at least early on here, until they figure it out. Because Reddick seems to be, not just seems to be, I guess, the production speaks for itself, that over the last four years, he's been a dominant pass rusher in the league, and Huff is just kind of hitting his, uh, not his ceiling necessarily, but hitting that high watermark of double-digit sack season last year. There was his first year right. uh, doing that in his career. Reddick had been doing that the last couple of years, but Reddick older, Huff on the other end. Who would you, re- you know, the boss asked her, where do you see yourself in five years? Well, uh, for yeah. Huff, that looks pretty gosh darn good. Uh, for Reddick, uh, perhaps not so much. So what do you do as a former NFL general manager, as Joe Douglas is dealing with this decision? Reddick has one year left on his contract for $14.25 million. He, he was, uh, you know, seeking a contract that seemed pretty apparent to everybody around. Yet uh, the Jets are slow playing this. They haven't given him, given him anything. No long term deal. No sweetener package. No nothing so far. Ultimately, what's what's the solution to this problem? If you were in that seat, what would you handle? What would you do here now that Reddick uh, and this situation sitting on your lap at a camp? Well, it, it's it's easy to criticize for what has happened to this point. So I'll jump in and just say, here's the, you know, the sandwich you've been dealt, and I'll let you insert the word. Here's what you've got. So. At some point, I think they are going to have to sweeten it. I don't think uh, you want to play hardball with one of your newest players necessarily who's going to have an influence in your locker room. I think that's that's an issue as well. I think they're going to have to find a way to maybe advance him the majority of that $14 million. Maybe you put some incentives in there to sweeten it a little bit. But I don't know about signing a long-term deal, and that may come from above Joe Douglas as well. That's, that's how one year in there are with this – deal. They've really what mortgaged a third round pick in 2025 to acquire him. So that's the price of paying poker. Um, I really can't see them extending him long term, which would take a financial um, a commitment from ownership. I just think he's going to eventually have to play. It may not be an ideal chemistry situation, but I think he eventually Hassan Reddick has to play for that $14 million unless he's willing to hold out the whole season, and I don't see that's going to happen. So I, I would find some way to throw him a life raft, Paul, some ra- way to throw him a life preserver to reel the deal in. I think you owe him, you owe the rest of your locker room that opportunity to not upset everything involved over this one deal. So, again, it's the price you've put yourself behind the eight ball with in going all in one year. 
And you noted it in your column. You've noticed the Woody Johnson spending was uh, interesting. This offseason. There seemed to be a lot of cutbacks, both uh, front facing that you can't avoid. And Rex Hogan and Chad Alexander, who both moved on. The Jets didn't seem to replace either of those. And then other sources have indicated that beyond the football operations, there appears to have been some cutbacks from some of the conversations with Rich Cimini of ESPN. So it does seem like there's something kind of going on there uh, from the financial perspective. And now you have this in a Hassan Reddick situation, which would be a lot of cash, I would imagine. It would be coming out of Woody Johnson's pocket, depending on potentially how he played this. So it's kind of interesting how you kind of noted that in your column here for The Athletic. Again, you guys should 100% read it. It's fantastic down below, directly linked. Uh, It seemed like you did kind of pick up on that uh, in your Well, yeah. I think it's a scheme fit as much as anything, and I'm not sure of Woody's plans and his commitment. I know this. Woody wants to win as much as anybody in the league. He's He doesn't want to take the criticism that they've taken. I actually think that it is a great organization to work for. He Nobody's given more rope to the powers that be than Woody Johnson and, and his family. It just hasn't gone the way uh, the decision makers had hoped at this point. But I do know this, a long-term commitment to a a positional player in the front seven that strictly relies on being a scheme fit, that doesn't make a lot of sense either, especially if everybody is known to be on a one-year deal, and that includes the coach, the GM, and everybody. So it it just, it doesn't make sense to sign him long-term if he may not fit for the next regime if it doesn't work out. Yeah, and I really want your your take on this because this has been a new layer that's come out because a lot of people have said Hassan Reddick seemingly, obviously, wanted a contract before he was even dealt uh, to the New York Jets. And then now we're in the situation we're like, ah, Jets, what the hell are we doing over here? But Ritzamini revealed, and so did a few of the other insiders, that it appears that when the Jets spoke with Hassan Reddick prior to the trade, the Eagles allowed them to do so. They appear, apparently, according to some of the uh, sources, told Hassan Reddick, Hey, man, we might adjust your contract, but we're really not thinking of a long term deal. You you play out this year crazy. Someone's going to pay. It'll be us or somebody else next year. And apparently Hassan Reddick, according to the sources, was copacetic with that. And then they agreed to the trade. It happens. And apparently Hassan reads the room and says, oh, JFM gets traded away. Oh, Bryce Huff is gone. Hmm. I know I agreed to that before, like a handshake agreement, but uh, the yeah. the situation has changed per Reddick, and that initially when he agreed to go to the voluntary OTAs and the mini camp and not hold out or have any issues, it seems like Hassan Reddick has uh, had a change of opinion. If we were to believe some of these other stories that have since uh, come out, Randy, how does that hearing those details if you hadn't already, how does that potentially change the perception of this Reddick situation? And is Reddick in the wrong for potentially lying or misleading the Jets that everything's going to be okay just so he could get the trade in and get to his next location? Yeah, it puts everybody a little bit uh, in an awkward position, that's for sure. It's a he said, she said, only the parties that were on the phone that day, whether it was an agent or, or Hassan himself who Joe talked to or whoever else talked to him, they would know the facts behind it. But it makes it it makes it muddy for sure. And I don't know how you solve it. I do think this, that they're going to have to get creative, regardless of if somebody broke their word or not. I think they're a little bit of cooler, cooler heads are going to need to prevail. And maybe it's as simple as, like I said, adding a few incentive clauses and telling them you're not going to put the franchise tag on him. Some kind of, like I said, a life preserver. I hope that makes sense to the listeners, Paul. They're going to have to give him something to reel it in to make it happen. And and that's not ideal. But at the same time, uh, the Jets are so all in, they need him now because they let Bryce Huff walk. They need him worse than ever. So they're going to have to find a way to make, you know, both sides are going to have to uh, either take less or both sides are going to have to be happy at the end of the day. Yeah, both sides need each other, certainly, because Reddick wants to get the bag eventually, and yeah. obviously the Jets want to win, so uh, two sides yeah. benefit each other. The Jets realized that one of the big problems that uh, Joe Douglas attacked, it must have been priority number one, was the offensive line and, and investing resources, and he did creatively. He lures Tyron Smith, formerly the Dallas Cowboys, and has a trade from his old uh, place of employment, the Baltimore Ravens, to acquire uh, Morgan Moses, and they are now responsible. Those are your starting two tackles heading into 2024. They're responsible for protecting Aaron Rodgers. I ask you, Randy, how do you feel about that confidence-wise with those two uh, uh, 33-year-olds, I do believe, that are uh, tasked with that uh, responsibility? Well, I think it's what if. That's the whole thing. They're playing the if game. It's a risky It's a risky move. 
Um, no one's going to argue Kyron Smith's credentials when healthy. That's the caveat is when healthy. He hadn't been healthy much the last two or three years. And I think Morgan is, is Moses is, is a solid right tackle who you can get by with in certain offenses. I don't think he's the future by any means. And, and obviously they don't either two 33 year old guys. So um, they probably made the, made the best of a, a tough situation. You tackles don't grow on trees. They didn't have, you know, uh, a chance to address this long term, so at least we'll address it again for one year and see how it shakes out. They've spent some money on the offensive line. They've also drafted players in the past, as you know, Paul, that just haven't worked out yet. So they're probably going to have to look at their processes and the evaluative, you know, uh, really schemes that they use and make these additions fit a little smoother. They just, for whatever reason, these offensive linemen and they've spent. Well, as you know, the spent a lot of high first round picks and they just haven't worked out. Randy, I'm curious. We go to the draft and for the second year in a row, the Jets seemingly in the first round have selected a player that isn't expected to get a bunch of playing time. They pick Olu Fashnu with the 11th overall draft choice. And again, he is not projected to start at this point. I'd be surprised uh, that unless Tyron Smith wasn't healthy, what other reason, how would he get uh, into the starting lineup? And then the year before, Will McDonald was the 15th overall pick uh, of that draft. He ended up having the lowest amount of snaps for a first rounder in Jets franchise history since Vernon Golston. That was a long time ago. So it's been a big gap. He didn't play a lot. Olu isn't expected to play a lot. Uh, what do you make of that? That seems uh, bravado, confidence for a general manager in an all in season in two years in a row to invest in a player that isn't going to play much. That, that would be like, hey, don't worry, I'm going to be here in the future. Or what is the other read? to those selections in those situations? Well, I'll just take Olu, for example. I know he was going to figure into a lot of other teams had he not gone to the Jets. Um, And those teams thought he would play for them early on. So maybe it's actually a good move by Joe to not have to play him, but understanding that this gives us a little margin for error. This gives, if Tyron Smith isn't healthy, gives us another option, which they really had done. So I like the move of an offensive tackle. The pass rusher from last year, I always think those are situational. I understand you can never have enough pass rushers. But for me, he's going to have to find his way on the field more to make that pick worthy that high. But I like the Olu move, whether he plays or not. You know, I I wouldn't criticize uh, the selection of him because I think you're getting value both short term and long term with a player of his skill set. Now, uh, it's beautifully written in the piece, uh, Randy, as a general manager, you even mentioned it during this conversation, you have to have a foot in the present and a foot in the future at the same time. That's part of the job of balancing both of those worlds. But with Joe Douglas entering year six, that's the final year of his deal. And Salah, four of five years, essentially the end of his deal based on all the pressure we've already talked about. The Jets have some big decisions coming up next year. That historic class that Joe Douglas has got a lot of rose petals Mm -hmm. at his feet for, and understandably so, are all set to be paid. It's a first-world problem, but with all these guys seemingly garnering long-term deals that they will be in the conversation for, how do you handle that as a general manager? Because, again, it doesn't matter if they wanted to pay him right now. They couldn't. They can't because of the right. CBA. They can, uh, they're can. they eligible to pay all of those guys starting next year. How do you balance it out? How do you choose who to pay first and not pay first or pay at all? How do you make those decisions? Well, it's hard because you're in this one-year window of, you know, fail or, or fools, one of the two, and makes it really tough. And really what made me think about it for the column that you mentioned is that the Browns just resigned their head coach, um, Kevin Stefanski, and their GM, Andrew Barry. They have an issue with on, uh, with Cooper, the receiver. And I loved Andrew Barry's comment when he said, the business side will take care of itself. We will work that out eventually. That tells me that there's going to be a longer term plan for Cooper in play, and it may take them a year or so to get to that point. Obviously, the the star power that you mentioned that the Jets have in their younger players, there's really not an eye on those deals, how they will shake out a year from now. But those deals in particular are all that, that I think you need to take time to cultivate those. And who knows, there may be a total different scheme set if, if the coach doesn't survive it as well. So I just think it puts the whole franchise in peril when you can't have a long-term vision on, we all know their core players and the young guys are really good, but I do think you, sometimes those deals just take time. That's what I was saying, Paul. They take a year. They might take a year and a half to communicate, to value both sides so that you end up can make a deal next February or March or whenever it is, April. 
It just takes time and some people skills. And now you've actually have doubt on those guys aside with their representation as well saying, do I want to sign a long-term deal or even talk to these guys about it? Cause they may or not may or may or not be there. So there's just a lot of indecision on both sides when a franchise is in, in, you know, on a tipping point in a one-year deal like they are. And some of those people's social skills, I'm kind of curious, because you probably, it's probably unlikely, I would imagine, and if I'm wrong, feel free to correct me, to pay all four of these guys, if all these four have a, another wonderful year, to pay them all next year probably seems unrealistic. And if that yep. is unrealistic, you have the one that you ultimately pick is probably one of them gets the bag early next year. What from a general manager perspective, what conversation do you have with the others to say, hey, uh, you know, it's the business. I'm trying to work on this. I know you want your money now, but like, how do you explain that you're doing a job, but they kind of don't probably care about that. They just want their money. So I, yeah. how do you balance that? Well, the GM's job is number one is the allocation of its resources. And, and that comes in the form of contracts to these players. There's there's one pie and you got to divide it up as to who's going to get what when it comes to the salary cap. So I don't know how you explain it to those guys. Uh, I think you have to have a dialogue in some way. And maybe it's as simple and maybe Joe's done this. I don't know. You'd have to be honest and upfront with these guys. Hey, I don't know what's going to shake out. We need to win games this year. I can promise you you're going to get paid if we have success this year. And maybe that's the way you approach it. Uh, that's the way I would probably do it if I were in Joe's shoes at this at this stage. Do you have a hard, fast rule on running backs? Because that's one of the four. Brees Hall, he's been a wildly entertaining player. He's a second-round draft choice, so his contract obviously has been a very controlled number during this rookie deal and will continue to be uh, as it progresses here. Do you have a line, and I've heard other ESPN analysts and others say, hey, you draft them, you run them into the ground, maybe a franchise tag, and then you just let them go and let someone else make that decision. Is that a hard, fast rule for you, or it's case by case if a special player like Brees is so unique in a way that – that, that that's an exception to the rule and uh, he's different. What, what's your take? I think you got to take them one by one. I think each of these running backs around the league has played out differently and rightly so. I just think in order to get paid for one thing, you can't be a runner of the ball. In my opinion, you have to be a weapon. You've got to be able to play on third down. You've got to be able to block on third down. You've got to be able to run the ball first, second down. You've got to be able to contribute on all three downs. Say a Saquon Barkley. That, that is an easy one for me. Um, so if you have that skill set, you're going to probably get paid by somebody. So no, my rule is not hard and fast. I don't necessarily think you should run them into the ground. But the other thing is that, that especially those offensive guys, they're going to want to know what the scheme is as well. They're going to know what kind of offense they're playing in. So the scheme is as much in doubt as the player's future based on the fact that does the skill set fit with what we want to do? Are we going to run a two-back system? Am I going to have a fullback in front of me? Am I going to have a tight end moving as an H-back in front of me? What kind of running plays are we going to run? It's got to fit scheme-wise to value a player like Brees Hall, too. And I don't know. I don't know how this scheme is going to play out this year. Obviously, he's a good player. Um, you're going to have to start that negotiation, I think, fairly early. The problem with starting some of these negotiations, Paul, early is that you have to have a deadline as well because nothing will happen unless you have some kind of a deadline. Everybody can ask for the moon when all the other side can say is no. There's nothing at risk for asking for it at this stage. So at some point, there'll be a deadline. It, it may be Joe running up against it and having to sign a whole bunch of guys next February when the season ends, or it, it may be some other decision makers. Who knows? That's That's the whole, I think, dynamic behind going all in like they've done so much for this year. Yeah, when I look at this group, this four, Sauce Godner, Garrett Wilson, Bree Saul, Jermaine Johnson, Sauce seems easy because universally he's accepted as the number one corner in football. Okay, he's the highest paid corner. Bing, boom, bam, whatever at that time it is, he seems that one. The ones, some of the ones that are more complicated, it's like Garrett Wilson, who's been really talented, but obviously he's been compromised from the quarterback play. So he probably doesn't have the numbers he would have if he was in a better offense. So it's it's hard to just say, oh, he's clearly number one wide receiver. Most of the wide receiver rankings in the league do not feature him inside the top 10, but he knows how good he is. So, but when you're at the negotiating table, are you pointing to numbers? What are you pointing to to try to determine his value to you and how you can pay that as it compares to the rest of the league? He seems like a very complicated case, Garrett Wilson does. And I think you're answering your own question. I totally agree with you. I think probably sauce fits in most schemes to where you can probably value him uh, as long as he's healthy and his skill set stays the same this year. And there's no reason to think he's not. He's probably first on the list because it, regardless of who the coach is or what we're doing, defensively, you everybody's going to want a guy like Sauce Gardner. 
the other guys really determine their value by production. And you're right. I, I can't help it that Garrett Wilson doesn't have numbers. That's not a problem. I mean, we think he's good. There's reasons he hasn't doesn't have those slight same numbers. Hey, Brandon Ayuk's facing that a little bit right now with the 49ers. His numbers aren't what some of these other guys have gotten, but I think we all value him as a really good player. There's been enough production to understand, in my opinion, that he has value. That probably has to happen for Garrett Wilson. Garrett Wilson has to have a really good year if he wants to get paid. I know there's a lot of talk and a lot of people think he's really good, and we've seen flashes of it. I've also seen the other end of the spectrum, in my opinion, Paul, with him, in that I have some questions about him. He needs to go have a solid, consistent year to put all the doubters, uh, you know, quiet him. That's for sure. Uh, Randy Mueller here again. We have a front office view reunion party. Where are the balloons and the cake and everything else that should be <laughs> happening on this program for Pete's sake? Our, our production crew offhand has to be working on that. There's no question about it. <laughs> and uh, one of the one of the things uh, that I also, uh, as I'm kind of looking at this situation of the New York Jets, and not a lot of people are talking about it. It was in your article here, Randy, about the upcoming Rogers dead money. It's something literally when you had it in there, I'm like, wow. Randy's the first person I've seen even kind of address that this is this is there. And Rogers is 40, turns 41 in December. Like it's something that apparently has been in the room, but everyone's kind of ignored it. And then you read it and I like a light bulb went off. I'm like, whoa, <laughs> what, what, what the hell is this? And I was reading. I pulled some of the numbers here that uh, Rogers uh, could have a, a dead cap of 35 million in 2026, as much as 49 million in 2025 if he retires, which, of course, how could that not possibly on the be on the sheet of uh, within the realm of possibilities if something else happens to Rogers? How in God's green earth do you, is there any way to kick some of that down the road? Would that have to be a new contract? How did that, like those are abnormal, not abnormal, the, well, I guess abnormal, but these are just <laughs> large numbers that are just yeah. going to suddenly factor in and no one has been discussing it. Well, I can't explain why nobody's picked up on it. I do know this as a GM, you have that in your mind all the time. It would be one of the reasons that would keep me from sleeping soundly. Uh, maybe Joe, it doesn't bother him. But yeah, those numbers out there on a 41-year-old quarterback, that's an issue. It's its not that you can't take the dead money. It's the things you can't do when you have that on your books. Um, maybe he doesn't care and maybe it'll be somebody else's problem. But they're they are not going away. Those are real dollars that have to be accounted for and and Maybe it's accounted for in 25, maybe it's accounted for 2026, but they're real and they'll affect the team build and they'll affect who else you can pay. So I understand these quarterbacks and, and some of the things that the Jets had to acquiesce to to get Aaron on board. But it, again, it's another uh, thing that comes at a price when you go all in on older players. And we talked about this in prior conversations before, Randy, when we're talking about a free agency board that teams will have and how they're kind of stacking and power ranking free agents against each other or a draft board where you have a vertical and horizontal features in the board. How is it, because you've mentioned this in your column as well, that the Jets, on top of all the players we talked about, have guys like DJ Reed? Tyler Conklin, Michael Carter the second, go through the list of other guys. How do you stack that in terms of priority with a bunch of guys that are in contract years? There's new those are guys that are on the team, but there have been new guys like Tyron Smith was one year deal, Mike Williams yeah. one year deal, all these others, those are also factored into the big equation. How do you stack those in terms of importance and paramounts and who's who who do you pay first? Because there's all kinds of different positions. There's corner, tight end. Like it's kind of all over the place in terms of positional value on who you pay and how you decide which one you're going to pay over one or the other. Yeah, Javon Kinlaw as well. Throw him right? in there. So you've got all levels in the secondary up front. You've got linebackers. You got everybody on one year deals. So what will happen with some of those one year deals is if you determine if you're going to pay them or not, might be based on who else is in free agency and how you can. Uh, not take a step back. So you're going to probably plug those names in. And you just mentioned the one year deal guys, you're going to plug those names in on a free agent board and compare them to who the other free agents will be for 2025. And if your guy, it, it makes the most sense to you, you're probably going to have to sign him sooner than later. So that's commonplace. And those plans take time to develop. And so somebody's going to have to make those decisions. It might be that during the season, you might find, and let's just use Kinlaw as an example. He has a good first half of the year. He might be somebody you want to pay for future years, but maybe the team isn't having the same type of success. So what happens there? You just you know, the whole thing, Paul, is you've created a lot of doubt and a lot of questions and a lot of angles that it's easy to and fun to say we're all in. But it comes with a price. That's the only point I'm trying to make. 
Randy, what the heck do you do with Elijah Vera Tucker? He's a guy yeah. that I, I've heard Daniel Jeremiah sing sing the sweet songs of like well, the the uh, glimpses of potential he saw in his rookie year. He's been unable to stay healthy, missing uh, twenty three games over the last two seasons. But again, I keep hearing the comment <laughs> when he's healthy, he's in. Well, shoot, I haven't seen in three years. I I don't know what it is. And the Jets exercised the fifth year option, which it seemed like there were some questions about. That's fifteen point three million, fully guaranteed uh, for not twenty twenty four. That's the twenty twenty five uh, season. And and the new CBA, that's injury and everything. It's fully guaranteed no matter what. What do you do with Elijah Vera Tucker? Well, the Jets have done it. They've pulled the cord on, on, like you say, guaranteeing that option year. I'll be honest with you. I'm like you, Paul. I just haven't seen it. So they must see something in practice, something in this kid's wiring, something in his character that they really want him to be a part of. Everybody keeps saying, well, he's a tackle. He can play guard. He can play anywhere. I just want to see him play one spot. That's all. Just tell me where you want to play him, and let's see if we can get 15, 16 games in of one season. I just haven't seen that. So I'm with you. I don't know what you do with him. You'd like to say, and he was one of the inferences I'm making when I say they've invested these high picks that just haven't worked out. They did it with the big tackle, Becton, as well. So they thought they had uh, issues solved when they drafted these two guys. Come to find out, now they're signing old guys to replace them. So it's a struggle. I what teams sometimes do, and I'm not saying they're doing this with Vera Tucker, is they will address the option year almost as a uh, a pat on the back and can't re- wait to reward our own selves for finding a player. And you see that around the league. And so that always comes into play as well, especially on a guy for me that I haven't seen produced to the level that they're going to pay him. I'm thinking, well, are they are they anointing their own guy, just trying to take credit for this guy who really hasn't played? Dallas, I've always said over the years, has a, has a tendency to do that as much as anybody. They want to, they can't wait to overpay their own guys because they think they're smart. They think they're good players and then, and it's never worked out. So I, I, I don't know what the Jets are thinking. Um, that to me is a struggle, especially if he ends up being a guard only and not a tackle. Um, I just think guard is a position of you can find those guys probably for a little less than 15 million. That's all. Yeah, that's for sure. And again, it's to what you said, jack of all trades, master of none to hear yeah, all exactly. these wonderful. Oh, he can he could speak Guatemala and he could do this. He could do that. And then I'm like, well, OK, but can he play just yeah. guard? Well, yeah. just well, one place. <laughs> Give me one position. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's what I a few years ago, I remember everyone being infatuated with. And this is a different position. But Isaiah Simmons coming out of Clemson. Oh, he could rush yeah. the passer. He could cover. He could be your brother, your sister, your mother. Your, yeah. And I'm like, oh, wow, that sounds spectacular. Yeah. They get to the NFL and almost coaches are so like overwhelmed. But ah, he could do everything. So let's just give him a little bit of everything. And then we're like, whoa. It, 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 uh, people have thrown bust around and all these other things. So we haven't right. seen him kind of settle into one thing. He's just been too busy kind of learning a lot, doing a lot. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's part of the development process. And I know this, if you keep moving players around or for whatever reason, if they don't know what they're doing, they're never going to develop. And, and I'm not saying he doesn't know what he's doing, but when you move players all over the place, it's hard for them to perfect their skill at the NFL level to make a difference. It's easier to do in college or when the competition is less, but you get to the NFL, you better do one thing really good and your coaches better be able to identify that and put you in a spot where that strength is accentuated. And sometimes we see, like you said, uh, uh, a bunch of new toys and you want to move them all around, play with them all. Just pick your favorite toy and let's play them right there, you know. That's it. And Randy, the last one before we get you out of here, and it's it's simply on this. I just want your gut, your gut feel. What do you believe Jet fans are going to get this year with Aaron Rodgers and the New York Jets? Because there's all kinds of expectations. But to be honest, we don't have a large sample size of 39 slash 40 year old quarterback tearing their Achilles and coming back in these unique circumstances in Super Bowl all in or all out season. So we have no history, which has left a lot of people going, no idea. I've asked players on the team. Hey, what kind of Aaron Rodgers are getting this? You're like, no clue. I'll let you know what I know. Uh, so yeah. there's a lot of mystery here. So uh, unveil the mystery for Jet fans. We're opening up this present in September, August, uh, October, November. Uh, what are we getting here with the New York Jets in 2024, Randy? Well, I'm not one to drink the Kool-Aid of what all of the things we've talked about. I just think so many things have to what if to, to be good. I understand the passionate Jet fans thinking this is a Super Bowl year. I get it. I'm just not buying that. I think if there's some way the Jets could win nine or ten games, that's probably about as good as you could expect. 
Um, I don't know where Aaron's leg is. I can't imagine he's going to be the same old Aaron after this. Um, I just think there are so many things in question. You have to, you'd have to check 10 boxes, in my opinion, to say, oh, the Jets are going to go win the division. And I just don't think all those boxes are going to go as planned. I just, I've been a part of too many NFL seasons to where you think you have something on paper that might be the answer and it never turns out that way and you got to be able to adjust. I just don't know if the Jets have the, have the wiggle room to be able to adjust to some of the things that they're really counting on. And if they don't happen, I think they're, they're dead in the water. So I, yeah. I'm thinking nine or 10 wins and that, that, that's have to be seen as, as a positive for me. All right, we'll have to see if uh, the on paper, which everyone drools about during the offseason, can turn yeah. into actuality. Uh, we'll find that out in a couple of months. Randy, it's great to be able to catch up after all this time. I love getting to keep, keep up with you on social media, all the podcast and the articles. Every time I see an article, I'm like, ooh, Randy wrote this. Okay, let, let me check out this. I give it a, you know, some extra TLC to make sure I'm appreciating all the uh, verbiage and podcasts and whatnot that's going out there. So, uh, Randy, it's always great catching up, pal, and uh, uh, great to chat. Thanks for the support, Paul. Always good to be back with you anytime. All right. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in, and uh, we'll see you next time. Take care.